good afternoon. Thank, thank you very much for coming. Uh, let's, let's, let's come to order, please. So, um, good afternoon. I'm Michael Lash, uh, Chair of the uh, Department of Economics. Um, and uh, welcome, Provost Saros, uh, alumni, students, colleagues, guests. Uh, let me begin uh, very simply. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom, our speaker today, is an intellectual giant. Professor Ostrom rejected the bleak allure of the, um, of the so-called tragedy of the commons and the implied Hobson's choice between privatization and authoritarianism. Um, on the contrary, Ostrom observed that the earth is full of sustained and functional commons in which the institutions of the commons help people to cooperate and to act collectively to promote the general welfare. Professor Ostrom defined an alternative theory of the commons and, perhaps as importantly, a meticulous and reproducible method to document, and maybe even more importantly, to equip her students and her students' students and their students in turn, maybe there's a lesson here about a sustainable intellectual commons lurking somewhere, to document case after case of successfully maintained commons from forestry in South Asia to irrigation systems in the southwestern U.S., really, around, around the world. Her work and that of her students has transcended mere documentation, although that's, as I said, has been rigorous and meticulous. The academic research has become one of the bulwarks of commons maintenance. Professor Ostrom is Distinguished Professor, Arthur F. Bentley Professor of Political Science and Senior Research Director of the Workshop in Political Theory and Policy Analysis at Indiana University. She's also the Founding Director of the Center for the Study of Institutional Diversity at Arizona State University. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Philosophical Society. Her list of publications redefines entire disciplines. I won't list it here. Her list of prizes is as long as many distinguished uh, professors' lists of publications. One prize is especially noteworthy. Eleanor Ostrom won the 2009 Nobel Prize in Economics, becoming the first woman to do so in the 40-year history of the award. In its recognition of her work, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences noted, Eleanor Ostrom has challenged the conventional wisdom that common property is poorly managed and should be either regulated by central authorities or privatized. So it's indeed a pleasure to welcome her to the University of Massachusetts. This afternoon, Professor Ostrom will deliver the 2012, uh, 2011 Gamble Lecture, <laughs> being ahead of us, 2011 Gamble Lecture of the Department of Economics. The Philip Gamble Memorial Lectureship Endowment was established by Israel Ragosa, class of 1942, um, another example of you know, pay, paying it forward, and other families and friends in, me in memory of Philip Gamble, a member of the economics uh, faculty from 1935 to 1971, who chaired the department from 1942 to 1965. The fund supports an annual lecture series featuring a prominent economist, Previous speakers have included five previous Nobel Prize winners, all male, I think, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, B Barbara Bergman, Lonnie Guinea, Robert Reich, Robert Schiller, Danny Roderick, a long list, most recently financial journalist Gretchen Morganson. This afternoon, we are honored by the presence of members of the Ragosa family, Marty and Elizabeth Ragosa. Th thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, Marty is a uh, 1979 graduate of the Eisenberg School and the steward of the Philip Gamble Memorial Lectureship. Uh, Elizabeth is a 1988 zoology uh, graduate. Th thank you. Welcome and, and thank you truly for, for attending. The Gamble Lectureship is also supported by the Charles L. and Martha S. Gleason Fund. Charles and Martha were economics graduates in 1940 and 1942. Both are now deceased, but their legacy uh, li lives, lives on. In 2005-2006, the University of Massachusetts Amherst sponsored a series of lectures and conversations entitled the Forum on Social Wealth to think about the commons in the new light sh uh, shown by, by Professor Ostrom. We developed these lectures into an undergraduate course, Econ 105, Introduction to Political Economy, recommended to all of our undergraduates. Um, while we were developing the class, we looked for a voice who would deliver the last word in the course, and we chose Eleanor Ostrom. So um, please join me in giving her the last word once again and welcoming Professor Ostrom.
thank you very, very much for inviting me. I much, much appreciate the invitation, and I've had some wonderful discussions with colleagues and students here, and it's just been great. So I, I enjoy it. And uh, I'm an, it's a somewhat controversial position I'll take, and so I won't be upset if some people want to challenge it, but we'll talk about it. Um, so um, the, um, uh, I think we have to agree that climate change is the largest commons. Um, pardon me? Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. So it, we're dealing with a very large commons that I will argue in a few minutes uh, is not modeled very uh, correctly. But um, the, um, I am asked repeatedly if what we've learned from uh, fisheries and water system, et cetera, has an automatic uh, relevance uh, for studying uh, the global. And there's one aspect of what we have learned is that nested systems at multiple scales uh, tend to be sustainable um, and ones that are operating entirely independently of either larger or smaller tend not to be. Um, but it's also a global public bad um, and uh, in terms of climate change and greenhouse gases, the problem of greenhouse gases, no one can be excluded from it. Um, and uh, everyone does have an implicit and in, uh, negative incentive to do something about it. Um, and what disturbs me is that people see that one of the impacts uh, of our use of uh, um, electricity and other things is global, then that is perceived as the only, and thus the only way of taking care of it is global. And I will be arguing that global solutions are very important, but we're not moving. And uh, we've mismanaged, we've misconceptualized it, so I want us to think about an alternative way. Okay. So I will be arguing that we do not need to wait. Um, uh, it looks to me like it could be another 10 years, maybe even more, before we got some international agreements. And I don't think we can afford to wait that long. Um, and there are lots of debates on this issue. And uh, I happen to have uh, some reasoned views, but I'm not going to get into that today, because um, I'm not concerned about the globe as a governance agency. I am very concerned about our shared planet and what we, and the problems that we all face uh, with uh, greenhouse gases going up. And uh, then we've got some really nasty problems on the policy side of how do we develop policies that don't reward those that were the most selfish in the earlier period, including some of us. And so uh, there are efficiency questions, effectiveness, moral, all sorts of questions. So uh, these are difficult uh, and important debates. And there are reasonable proponents on many sides. And um, I think we have some reasoned uh, capabilities of what we can do. But I want us to move ahead. So um, I think that's what my basic message. OK, let's go. So. Um, Debate, I debated in high school. I learned a heck of a lot of, uh, from debate. And it's important that we engage in good discourse about it. But debate alone, without coming up with some things that are feasible, doesn't get us anywhere. Um, and we do eventually need global action. So please do not interpret that I'm saying it's useless at the global level. I'm just saying, right now, we're not moving. So there are many other things we can be doing. And just waiting uh, makes it potentially uh, much, much more difficult. Uh, so we're facing not only warming, but very great variability in climate and um, upsets on uh, a whole bunch of different scores. Um, so then what I want to do is, um, in order to move ahead, um, we want uh, to look at a variety of questions. Um, the first question I'm going to raise is a uh, kind of a, a social scientist question. Is the conventional theory we use for collective action the best theory 
for analyzing the problem. And of course, I've been attacking that theory for some time in terms of it's the underlying theory of Garrett Hardin and Mansur Olson and many others. Uh, and so my answer is obviously no. Um, but uh, we have to uh, think about this hard. Um, as it, the conventional theory is interpreted, um, uh, none of us will stop uh, emitting uh, uh, greenhouse gases, and all of us need the government on top of us to stop it. Um, and um, they accept the, uh, the uh, theories of Garrett Hardin and Mansur Olson, uh, and there are some aspects of their theories that are correct. It's just their policy recommendations of where they carried it. Uh, and frequently I'm wrong. And um, the idea that we must have global theories is uh, eventually correct, but that doesn't mean it's exclusively. So I'm going to be uh, addressing a variety of questions. Um, besides uh, uh, the um, uh, conventional theory, um, the one that is kind of the foundation for what I'm dealing with here is um, are global benefits the only benefits generated? And I'm going to be making an argument that a lot of, of our daily actions generate greenhouse gases eventually that is a harm to the entire globe. But uh, it's also a harm uh, to many of us locally and we need to be thinking of it only, right now we think of individual, blow. I think we need to be thinking of individual uh, externalities at the individual level, at the family level, at the small community level, at the little bit larger level, at a regional level, at a national level, and an international. Uh, that changes the way we analyze it, and we can do a much more rigorous job of analyzing it. Um, and uh, I don't know how many times people have said, oh, anything local, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, it doesn't have an impact on the entire globe. Well, if the only thing you're trying to avoid are global externalities, and you don't see the externalities at lower levels, then indeed, <laughs> forget it. But if there are externalities that can be avoided at multiple scales, then taking action at multiple scales can have a big impact. So, um, we can have still more questions. Uh, are large-scale governments always better equipped? Um, are they the ones that will solve collective action uh, universally above smaller scale? And another one, people, uh, a lot of people, uh, some of the uh, colleagues here have been saying, oh, if we have too many units involved, isn't that chaotic and isn't it difficult? And yes, but um, if you don't have more than one and one doesn't do anything, uh, it might be a lot better to have uh, multiple. And then the last question uh, is really the title of the talk, um, how might a polycentric system with uh, uh, various mechanisms that very small, and moderate, somewhat bigger and bigger all the way to global, can it make a difference? And polycentricity is a concept that comes out of the work of Vincent Ostrom and Charles Thiebaud back in the 60s as they were looking at urban phenomena and arguing that in a metropolitan area there were not benefits that were strictly for the entire metropolitan area, which was the argument, and that there were uh, polycentric systems that were very important. Okay, so now let's do a quick overview of collective action theory. Um, and um, uh, the, um, the presumption is that it does uh, explain uh, the um, use of uh, activities which produce greenhouse gas and uh, global externalities. And obviously reducing uh, the use of uh, cars and uh, uh, lowering furnace uh, use, etc., can be potentially very costly and costly for the individual. And if there are no benefits for the individual and the only benefits are global, it really is a difficult. Because uh, no one wants to be a sucker. And uh, we have all sorts of reasons for uh, assuming that people uh, will not voluntarily act if it is only to solve a global problem. So the conventional view um, captures um, the nature of many problems. 
Um, but um, uh, it basically saying if we don't do anything and we don't ask the government to come in and solve it, nothing will happen and we are in bad shape. Now, the support for this theory, empirically, has been pretty weak. And so what I have been doing since the 60s is addressing uh, uh, this from a very wide diversity of fields, the first groundwater in California, then policing uh, in terms of public goods around uh, the U.S., uh, and then irrigation systems uh, in Nepal and uh, a variety of others, and now a very extensive work on forestry. And um, the, um, um, we are finding that um, when users see a future that they can affect and that they are more likely to be in that future that they can affect, then they are much more likely to take uh, action. And uh, in our uh, forestry studies, we are, have studies now in over 100 forests around the world and a uh, good statistical analysis. And we find that when the users themselves monitor, that's when forest conditions get better. And that's not in our theory. Uh, there's no discussion as people talk about uh, externalities that uh, some of those are at a local level and local people are concerned about it and local people will invent, I mean, investing in monitoring, um, that's something that's not I hope you all will go forth and recognize that in their papers in science and BNAS that show that very, very carefully. Uh, so we need to change the basic assumptions that we're using, and some of you may not be too happy about that. I don't want to change uh, market theory when we're talking about market problems. Um, there's no need to change it. But I want to just apply uh, economic theory as we've evolved it for the market for commons is not adequate. Um, and we need to rely on a behavioral theory of human action. Um, and one of the things that we have found in our research is that building trust, not trust, building trust is a very, very important thing that people do who can solve these problems. And uh, then, as I mentioned, we need to be thinking about of nested externalities and not just one. So if we turn to the problem of a behavior, this isn't behaving the best. <laughs> a behavioral theory of human action, I draw heavily on the work of human Simon, Herbert Simon, um, and, um, and the basic idea that people uh, want to be rational, want to obtain uh, outcomes uh, as best they can, but they frequently don't have complete information. They don't have a way of maximizing uh, in terms of the situations. And they can learn norms, and they can have preferences that involve payoffs for others. And um, so we need to be thinking of a broader theory of human behavior. Um, and uh, that's at the foundation of what we're working on. Then we need to be thinking about nested externalities and so, uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, besides uh, what does go to the globe, when you take a bike uh, out um, for a ride in the countryside instead of taking a car for a ride in the countryside, uh, you are producing a lot less uh, extra greenhouse gases and your health is better. So we haven't taken into account that biking and walking can produce benefits at the individual level and that there are externalities at the individual level of costs and health uh, problems that you can avoid. When a, uh, a neighbor, when a household uh, community in a community decides to invest in um, insulation, um, they are saving themselves money over a 10, 15 year period. Uh, and the externalities of higher cost uh, from heating their house uh, are avoided. Um, so uh, we really need to be thinking of a variety of externalities at multiple levels. So if there are no changes are, uh, are made, we'll have households that purchase X amount of carbon 
uh, by, um, uh, by either buying gas instead of bicycling or um, and furnace or things of this sort. If there were appropriate incentives that were overt, uh, they'd purchase less. Uh, and if we can make them overt, that's part of the policy debate of how do we make them overt. Um, and if they accept responsibility for limiting uh, costs to the family, they can reduce carbon by even more. And this is what I'm hoping can be done. So let's talk about heating of buildings. Um, the uh, building use is 40% of the primary, primary energy in the US, 14%. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been in an office or the university where you come in and uh, it, the heat was on all night and it's just, so what do you do? You open the windows. Uh, well, the heat ran all night uh, and um, uh, there's a great waste for the university. Um, and some universities have started a competition among the dorms. Very interesting process where uh, get the door, and they have to get good recording mechanisms, but get the dorms to compete of who can reduce their energy bill the most. And they can, for the campus, by getting a little competition in there, they can reduce it quite a bit. We've just started it, and uh, we did it at IU. It's an amazing sort of thing. Um, and um, so there's a very important article in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science by Dietz et al. And they could indicate that households could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 20% in 10 years if they did a variety of things like weatherization, better insulation, low flow sh shower heads. Now this one, folks, the next time you get in the shower, if you have to, oh my God, it's so hot, and you have to turn the cold water way up, think about what that means. You brought the hot water to this very hot level. You paying for all of that and pushing greenhouse gases up and then you can't stand it. <laughs> so uh, get your hot water down here. You don't have to get it down to cold, none, but you can use less cold water. It, it does not affect the efficiency of your uh, clothing washing in your um, um, dishwasher. And it's such a simple, simple thing. Um, the um, efficient water heaters, so not only uh, uh, getting the water heater turned down, but getting more efficient ones, uh, improved appliances. We just got a new uh, dishwasher, uh, permanent clothes washer, front loading, uh, very fast, uh, uses less water, uses less uh, heat. Very, I'm real pleased with it. Uh, getting fuel efficient vehicles. Um, uh, there are now lots of ways of uh, getting your thermostat at home or in your office so that when you're not there, it turns off. So you're not wasting 12 hours of heating or air conditioning. I mean, you think about it, it's just huge what we waste. Um, so that PNAS article is very useful. Uh, then there are community efforts that can be done uh, is to have community campaigns that address this, and I'm going to talk about two, one done in Sacramento and one done at Berkeley. I was born and raised in California. You'll have to pardon some of my approaches. <laughs> um, the uh, Sacramento Municipal Water Utility is a uh, private utility, so they were very concerned about having to expand and, buy, and build new plants and all the rest. And they started to take random samples of their users, and then they would rank them. And then they'd send back information to the users. So the bill compared uh, your household use with everyone else's uh, in your neighborhood. And so the bill looked like that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just giving people feedback information made a very big difference. Uh, they, they tried out something where they um, uh, put a face on it. And when they, uh, uh, this was after this, but uh, for those that were really good, they put a big smiley face. <laughs> um, and for those that are bad, they put a frown. And people who had a big family who got a frown got furious. Uh, and so they did finally stop the frowns, but they have kept uh, adding the smile. Um, 
And so um, the, um, uh, they got a lot of changed behavior. They tried a, a market uh, system of, uh, of trying to get people monetary rewards for reducing. Didn't work. This worked. Um, and um, I'll go on to Berkeley first. Um, this was a financing invest, uh, initiative uh, where they wanted to finance people who would do renewable or uh, solar. Um, and they wanted to overcome the burden of doing it because I just had solar put on my garage and I can tell you it's a pretty big bill. Um, but uh, what they wanted was the citizens, okay, you go get an estimate from a reliable uh, person. Bring it to us and we'll certify it. <coughs> and then you can get a loan up to 20 years at a low interest. And that is then paid uh, every year on your tax bill. How simple can you get? And so many people, they ran out of funds right away. Uh, they got it started, they ran out of funds, they got another one, they started. But if more locals will do that, it's one way of getting a lot of uh, uh, things uh, done at a local level. Okay, um, well, we have another question because everyone's saying, well, this still doesn't do any good, you gotta go large scale. Well, do they always work at the large scale? Well, we have a lot of, there are policies at the large scale that do work, but uh, it's pretty ambiguous. People point to the Montreal Protocol and say, oh, we did it. Well. Uh, there were only uh, five really big producers uh, of for, for, uh, whatever that was, um, and one of them was DuPont, and they had already discovered an alternative that they really wanted to use. So the biggest manufacturer said, great, put a limit on it. We'll stop right away, and we'll go in and make a lot of money because we have an alternative. So we can't just go to that. Uh, there were lots of other things about the protocol treaty, but it isn't an example of how to solve the kind of conflict situation that we now have. Um, the Canadian Department of Fisheries uh, on the east coast of Canada, a local fishermen were saying, hey, there's a problem, there's overfishing, it's a problem, it's a problem, it's a problem, it's a problem. And the ministry said, oh, you don't have the data. We've got the statistical data, and we know you don't. You're just dumb fishermen. And uh, two years later, it collapsed. Uh, so they didn't take the word of locals at seriously. And uh, then they, they had a massive collapse. Um, so um, that's a big problem. Uh, you go to EU, which is working on fisheries, supposedly, and that's not been successful. Uh, there are potential problems with multiple actors. Um, you can have leakage between, and so some people are kind of concerned that some of the firms in, in um, Europe that are local and have adopted policies that come local now are buying their uh, things from overseas where there's huge amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. And so you, you then buy it from there and have to do the shipping costs. So it isn't always the case if you uh, don't move to a larger that you've solved it all. Uh, there are other problems. Uh, you can have inconsistent policies uh, um, that um, uh, you can have um, uh, uh, that make it much more difficult to find a way of solving these problems. Uh, you're going to inadequate certification. We've been looking at a lot of the certification under the Kyoto Treaty, and some of it is just incredibly bad. Uh, you're going to free riding. Um, and so uh, having multiple, there's no question, they're problems. But right now they're problems. We can't get anything big. <laughs> so I'd say the problems that we're facing with multiple units uh, are not as big as the problems we're facing of inactivity, and I think we can move ahead a lot uh, uh, on a policy subject. So, I think the lessons that we're slowly but surely learning, uh, there are complexity of causes. Uh, there's not just one, it's not just a few large-scale industrial producers. Um, we're all doing it. Um, 
the, the knowledge of exact causes and effects is still developing. Uh, we've got a lot of scientific knowledge about the impact. I'm, I'm not challenging that, but there's still a lot to solve about getting good, tough data about uh, precise estimates. Um, but um, we do know that you know, with a number of the kinds of policies we might adopt, you could then find some opportunistic behavior. That, um, but I don't know any policies that people have evolved and d dealt with that don't have the chance of opportunistic be behavior. Uh, and I think that policies at any level can generate errors, and we have to be aware of it. So, uh, as I indicated earlier, I do propose a polycentric approach, uh, and the, that goes back to early theoretical, um, early theoretical work in the 1960s um, uh, in terms of urban problems. And um, uh, Vincent Ostrom and Charlie Tebow wrote a very important article in 61 arguing that instead of there being one uh, kind of good in a metropolitan area, even for uh, policing uh, or any of the wide diversity of things that governments do, uh, there are multiple scales. We then did um, uh, a series of studies from uh, the um, 1970s on that uh, were very, very rigorous. And we did find that metropolitan areas that had some large, like crime lab and dispatching, and then small and medium-sized police departments that had found ways of working together, this is where we found the most successful low crime, uh, low cost, so that uh, it affects both efficiency and effectiveness. Um, and um, so uh, this is not just a theory. It is uh, a theory that has been now tested with extensive uh, data. Um, and um, the uh, ignorance that people had, they were arguing that, oh, you've got to consolidate all those departments because they can't possibly do crime lab. Well, when we went out and did empirical work, we found out they weren't trying. They'd already figured out that it was better to contract with the local hospital or the state uh, or somebody. Uh, so our academic knowledge was lousy. Um, the uh, forest conditions, um, the, we have a collaborative network, the International Forestry Resources and Institutions Network. Uh, we have centers in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and we are doing some work in the U.S. at Michigan and at IU. And uh, we go in and we literally, and we had ecologists help us with um, teaching us how to measure trees and getting very good ecological measures. And we are uh, doing that. Um, and then besides doing all the information about the tree growth and diversity and all the rest, we spend a lot of time with local communities finding out what are their traditions? How do they make decisions? What kind of uh, rules? What, how broad gender representation of wide diversity of things? And um, what we found in a statistical analysis, because now we have a large N, if we look at uh, the impact of private forest, government forest, or community forest, just use those three broad terms, there's no statistical difference for a large number of forests. So people think I am recommending that community is always better. No. But um, the, um, what we're finding is that it's not the formal rules, but what they're doing locally, how much trust they have in one another, how much sense. So some government forests, people have a limited right to harvest. Um, and with a limited right to harvest, um, uh, non-timber forest products and mushrooms and uh, important things, uh, fodder for animals, all sorts of things, uh, they have a long-run future. And with a long-run future, they tend to monitor and be more active, and the forest condition is better. Uh, and so it's not just turning it over to the government or to a community. 
that makes a difference. It's getting complex arrangements that involve people really investing themselves. Um, so um, what we basically have in much of what we've studied is that instead of one global response or large scale, uh, we need to apply polycentric theory um, to develop complex, multi-level political, economic, social systems and recognize that sometimes the ones we design in the first place aren't going to work very well and we're going to have to go back and learn and redo, etc. That it has to be interactive. Um, and um, we need to gain more sophistication on the institutional side. Our ecologist colleagues have a lot of sophisticated knowledge about nested systems. Um, and uh, we don't. Uh, we treat things as the government or the market, even though the market may have 500 participants in it, uh, or even more. Um, and so we just need to be thinking of much more than one remedy. And my other argument will be that no matter what we do, uh, we need to be sure that locals are more involved. Uh, policies that are made in some national capital by a bingo meeting with a international or national government and drawing a map, a lot of international policies are the equivalent. They spend an hour, they draw a map, and then they tell everybody, this is our decision, and they expect everyone to honor it, uh, and they've never even looked at some of the areas. I've been in uh, forests in Nepal that were nationalized earlier after people had been 500 years of managing it themselves. It was just yanked away from them. Because after all, they couldn't. They were just peasants. Anyway, uh, I will open it for questions or discussion or however you guys want to run it. advertising and sometimes it's real, uh, sometimes it isn't. Uh, we, that's part of our problem with a lot of health products, that uh, sometimes it is just out on the label and uh, it's not real. Uh, but sometimes it is real and the more we get people instructed to be paying attention to uh, the way that uh, people are presenting, it's important. So that would be one of the sorts of actions that it fits in a polycentric theory. Uh, but I don't rely on that only. Got the, we have the beginning, but a lot of people have said, oh, that's useless.
I'm saying that it's better than waiting 10 years before we get some of that international action. Nobody's waiting. All of these things are going on. Uh, what do you mean nobody's waiting? Have we had any agreement? What did we do in Copenhagen? But not enough, and so we're not teaching it. So we, we teach that. We say, oh, that's just stupid because it's not making any difference. In this country, about almost half the people do not accept the proposition that the Constitution is the only thing that can be Yes, but I'm saying right now we're not getting any of that up there, and it is encouraging that there is a lot more going on at local levels. I'm not saying that that is going to be sufficient for the long run, but my proposal is let's do everything we can to improve that. And I'm still pushing for um, uh, large-scale solutions uh, at, as part of that. I'm not ignoring it. Uh, I just am, let's not sit around. I, I consider a lot of the current policy debate is twiddling our thumbs. And uh, I just don't think that's a reasonable way. I see it as a real threat. And uh, so then the more we can do and the more we can get neighborhoods to take action, the more we can get uh, things like Reggie in the uh, far west, far east in terms of the some of the market arrangements and the tax arrangements and some of the European, uh, not only you have the EU, but some of the large cities in Europe have really taken very major actions. Uh, we need more of that. So um, I think we have more chance of getting more of that than we have of getting a better treaties. If I thought that we could get better treaties if we just organized a little better, I'd go for treaties. And then also, because as soon as you have the treaties, you've got to figure out how to do the local and all to, to uh, fit the treaty. Uh, so the treaty gets an agreement, but how do you keep the agreement if you don't have various other policies at other levels? So uh, it's just that I don't like to see us wasting time and energy uh, saying, denying that you know, there's a lot more we can do. Uh, I'm an activist. Let's go. Yes, you highlighted the importance of monitoring and the role that plays. But will monitoring happen in the absence of ownership, or is it pretty much ownership has to happen and then the local communities are willing to monitor them? Well, see, monitor can, can be a little uh, thing on your utility bill, uh, and that was not that expensive to do. Um, and uh, they did uh, affect uh, use. And on the campuses where they've had the competition among dorms, they've gotten uh, a power use down 10%, 15% uh, on a dorm. And one of the things they're finding um, is that um, we are indicating those uh, heating things over there by your head, behind, that's very uninformative. Um, it tells you current temperature and you can play with it, but uh, it doesn't turn off when you're, the room is empty. Uh, it keeps going at the same level day and night. Uh, and in the dorms where they changed the meters so that people got better information and they could adjust it, then they got even more reduction. I was asking in reference to your forest monitoring, because I know with community conservation, less developed parts of the world, oftentimes the local community won't take care of the resources unless they own, have a stake in the ownership. It's a stake? is different than ownership. And that's what we were surprised. We expected to show community forest being better, and we were wrong. It isn't simple ownership. It is stake. Um, and, but stake, there are many ways of having stake. Uh, and uh, are you allowed to walk through? Can you pick um, wildflowers? Can you pick uh, various kinds of, uh, of um, mushrooms and things like that? Uh, that's not harming the uh, forest capacity to regrow, but you've got an interest. And so without a stake, yes, who, uh, why should you put in effort when they've taken it away from you? 
For many people, these they live there, they're forebears, they've been there for hundreds of years. And then the government comes along and says, you idiots, you don't know how to keep it. I mean, the insulting aspects of what we've done to indigenous communities around the world is pretty frightening. I do. I don't want to change uh, market organization in those areas where there are private goods with few externalities. So if you, uh, capitalism is one of those terms that is frequently used sparingly. And um, uh, if you're talking about the use of market organization for um, uh, products that have very few externalities, I don't know anything better. Um, but it's the difference between then idealizing and putting up as heroes people who make billions of money. That's not market theory. That's part of our social theory. Uh, and our social theory has led us to confuse making money with being great. And uh, I admire uh, successful entrepreneurs but I don't idolize them. And I think getting people to move away from idolizing political leaders and entrepreneurs who made lots of money was, would be important if that's what you're getting at. But capitalism is too broad a term. Jerry? Yeah. Uh, um, you counterpoint uh, market system with government. Well, and, and then argue we need something polycentric. But wouldn't a market system with proper prices be a polycentric system that would, uh, through the profit system, profit motive, and the you know the constraints of the prices, people would save uh, energy if that's what's needed and find the most efficient way to do it? I mean, why don't we just fix the price system um, and forget about everything else? Uh, because we've been proposing this and there's no action at all. Uh, and so I'm tired of waiting. Um, I do think that um, besides just pricing, that there are other things we can be doing. So that uh, my model of the individual, my theory of individual is a little broader than narrow, um, uh, rational choice at its narrowest. Um, but uh, uh, there are, some, you know, I'm for a lot of uh, cap and trade possibilities, uh, but nothing's happened. So uh, my discouragement is with uh, inactivity, and I don't see any move. I think we could be still debating on that in 10 years, 20, 15 years, and we continue the level of, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions for another 15 years. So I'm very concerned. And uh, whenever we can use various kinds of market mechanisms and governments uh, get uh, incentive systems that are real and uh, encourage firms to take very positive action, great, that's part of what I would see. Stupid decisions of government are not limited to just local. <laughs> so um, part of our problem is that we, uh, we turn and idealize um, uh, systems uh, as if governments always search out uh, the best interest of their citizens. And uh, our research shows they don't always. Some do at some times. But you've got to get into what, 
what are, uh, how are we choosing officials. Um, uh, we've evolved a system in the U.S. that is involving an awful lot more funds going from various kinds of private firms to government officials than we had 35, 40, 50 years ago. And uh, I think we can do an analysis that there are many aspects of that that are pretty, pretty, pretty dysfunctional. So um, I, I, my, my puzzle is that any one, I've seen local governments that are corrupt and uh, there are local leaders who just do very well. Uh, and I've seen that all the way up. Um, but um, you have a little more chance of learning about things um, at, um, well, and, and you can learn about them at all levels. Partly we don't teach. You look at the textbooks in government now, uh, there are not very many discussions about uh, some of the incentives for malpractice. And that should be a part of how, what we teach. Just like we should teach, I mean, we do teach monopoly in, in economics and the, ad, the bad aspects of monopoly. Um, and, uh, uh, but we are not teaching some of the bad aspects of <coughs> governance, and we should. And we don't teach local government hardly at all. Used to be that every freshman who took a uh, introduction to political science is one semester government national and one uh, state and local. State and local has disappeared. I'm very depressed about that. Uh, my question is related to the previous question. Uh, so I'm from a really small town, so in some ways we're saying, but uh, 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 the local solution is being the way forward in many of my years. But uh, the history of this nation, among others, is literally examples of people who weren't really attached to the land and who or or necessarily specific communities and regardless of resource to uh, extract and move and complete. Uh, how do you reconcile the sustainable practices you mentioned in, you know, quite throughout the entire lecture with uh, the existence of strip mining, where that is logging, and that kind of thing? If we look out there, we'll find some groups that are doing all sorts of positive things for the environment and others that are doing all sorts of negative. Um, and, um, but we are then waiting for the top down to uh, put taxes on and change the behavior of people motivated by profit motive uh, to um, do things that harm the environment. And uh, I'd like to get taxes on them. Uh, I'm not opposed to it. Uh, to some extent, we're starting to do a little bit more at the state level. And I'm very encouraged with that. Um, but um, uh, if, if that's what we wait for, uh, I, just, I'm, I just don't want us waiting. I want us to recognize it. Let's get in there and do things at various scales and really try to make a difference. And then we can learn from that and how, you know, some of those are going to be terrible failures. Well, let's learn from failures and move ahead. Yes, please. Well, one of the things would do have more people read the uh, uh, Deets et al. article in PNAS. I mean, that is one of the leading scientific uh, journals, and uh, very well. There's a new one coming out in PNAS about next week that is on some of these same issues, and it's good. Um, and uh, then, what like the um, 
the sorts of things that people were studying in the college efforts. There have been some very careful studies. Some of it's just advertising in college or going blah, 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 blah. But uh, some of it's been carefully studied. Uh, and there is good scientific information um, of what happens when people uh, have better dials and things of information. Um, so having all the scientific knowledge that you might need to th uh, think through ice melt, uh, that isn't needed for a lot of what I'm talking about. I, it's very important. I'm going to be doing a major study of ice melt in Kenya and the Rockies on uh, water systems and irrigation systems. Um, but um, I don't expect that's going to be impacting a lot of private decisions about uh, their use of uh, electricity. But I'm very interested in the way organ and that institutional arrangements at a local level uh, react to the threat. Um, and there's a very substantial threat uh, of uh, uh, ice uh, melt, uh, reducing the uh, amount of water that they have in the future. I don't think there's a simple way, but it, the more people uh, in freshman classes really get into some of these issues, uh, the more we work with community groups and we try to provide them information and things that they could be doing in their community, uh, we can slowly but surely make a difference. But uh, no, uh, we have an awful lot of the individual level decisions that are not in the long-term self-interest of the individuals who make them. teach that? Sometimes, uh, yes. <laughs> well, I think it's important, and see, I don't think we should stop teaching market theory, but we are. Um, profits are one criteria that we use for evaluation, but um, in a world of complex equity issues and ec ecological and environmental, we may want to be moving much more sensitively to a more complex picture of what is success. And we need to be doing that in our teaching. So we have a whole new generation who are studying with us. And um, let's not continue these things. And then writing for the press and interviews and things of that sort. Um, it's important that we stress the challenges of changing our systems to make them more sustainable. And instead of economic growth, sustainability is a much more important value, and we need to stress that, and we're not. So a lot of it is uh, at our feet as college teachers and what we, what we profess. 
whatever you're, you know you are and we're I guess at the time so why don't you please yes uh, Well, you slowly but surely take where uh, where is their action? You know, what legislators can you elect that have more likelihood to put taxes and other things on uh, uh, various kinds of firms? Um, uh, how do you get the press to cover uh, the uh, costs more effectively? Uh, there's no single thing, and there's no magic. It's organizing and getting the word out there and getting away from the sense that, oh, if it's a private firm, they can do anything if it's so long as they're making profits. Well, and I studied a problem back in the 60s that looked like it was going to disaster and it took a while. But uh, that basin is, that groundwater basin is now, 50 years later, in much better condition than it was earlier. So I guess partly I do have a, a sense that we can take difficult and costly steps and see 50 years later it is better. And right now, I'm afraid that 50 years from now we've got a disaster. I can't hear you. Well, there, that's one of the techniques. Again, I don't think there's any one, um, but uh, that's one technique that we have available to us that we, sh we can be thinking about. And here is where forests, this is where forests are very important uh, in that um, uh, the um, uh, uh, good forest land is apt to sequester a lot more carbon than uh, urban areas. It's not a panacea by itself, but it's something we should be thinking about and encouraging ways of, uh, again, trying to encourage people who invest in their forests uh, I'm not very encouraged with REDD, uh, reduced emissions and deforestation and degradation, because they're talking about huge sums of money and not very much on how to set this up institutionally so that they actually get a long-term reduction in emissions and more uh, uh, in, uh, uh, carbon stored. It's, uh, Big, it's big advertising right now, and uh, the I've, I've looked at some of the policy papers in this area, and uh, they're not very sophisticated. Uh, it's, it's again advertising. Okay. Well, the last question. Well, uh, more on the resource use and uh, the um, looking at indigenous communities, what they've done in recognizing, and at least what I've tried to do is make it apparent to many people that indigenous communities that uh, managed resources for centuries were not that dumb, and we've done grave harm by taking all their rights away from them, and we, the, what we've replaced it with is not very adequate.
but that's where I've done most of my work on that score. Yes, your own picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and before.